Hello, this is Herman Osterwick, and we're going to talk about selecting an integrated risk packs vendor. As I mentioned, my name is Herman Osterwick, and I'm president of OTEC, and I have a lot of experience in healthcare imaging and IT, about 30 plus years, and I participated while working in the industry for many years in the DICOM standardization organization, as well as HL7, where I was a uh, co-chair of one of the uh, special interest groups. And also I participated in several of the IHC connector towns where we tried to validate uh, whether vendors actually meet the different IHC profiles. I also published several textbooks. I wrote a book on PACS and on DICOM. And we also have uh, many study guides available for people that like to get certified for HL7, uh, DICOM PARCA, CIIP, and so on. And as of now, I don't have any known conflicts of interest that are related to this presentation. Now, this presentation is going to talk about uh, the most frequent issues and points to take in consideration when you want to change or start with a new vendor. And because mo many cases, people are looking for an integrated risk packs vendor, that's what actually the presentation is all about. But if you are just thinking about uh, changing only your risk or only your packs vendor, most of this is applicable as well. And when I listed the issues, I came about um, uh, to to I came about to 12, 12 issues that I think are are critical to review before you are, uh, want to consider changing your vendor or going into this new venture. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're talking about these issues, and, and and after the presentation, we'll do a, a a recommendation about what to do. Now let's first highlight the uh, top 12 critical issues, and then we're going to talk about each individual issue in more more detail. First of all, it is very important to collect extensive data from the users that are currently using your RISOPAX system. In many cases, you want to make sure that you don't make the same mistake. As a matter of fact, you want to make sure that you do better. So you want to go uh, to your current users. And with the users, I don't only mean the people that actually use the system, but also that support it or see the results or provide data entry and input to the system. So we want to collect that data and find out what are the highlights and the downsides. And, and based on that, make a decision to, to go with a system that could perform better than your current system does. Second, to be able to uh, do better, it's also critical to re-engineer the workflow. When you re-engineer the workflow, uh, you might be better uh, suitable in providing a more efficient system and provide better healthcare to your patients. In addition to not only looking at the current workflow, you might want to review all your procedures. Now, a procedure is something that that, that is defined not only for your day-to-day -day work, but also for the exception cases. But what is it that you do when you have a downtime, scheduled downtime, unscheduled downtime? Uh, what do you do with uh, security and privacy? So if you look at the procedures, then you might be able to also make a lot of changes there that could benefit uh, your overall institution and then do better by using a different system. A critical point or a bottleneck or weak point in many cases is the uh, import and export of data. There's no question that this will be, uh, that it is increasing uh, a lot and it will be even more increasing with the, the ongoing integration of our healthcare systems and the proliferation of electronic and personal healthcare records. So we want to reevaluate how do we data get the data in and how do we get it out uh, using CDs, uh, DVDs, and flash drives and other exchange media, but also electronically. That's where a lot of changes and improvements can be made. And also that's an area where we really will anticipate a lot of changes. Talking about changes, there's no question that over the lifetime of your system, there will be several software changes, such as operating system upgrades and new applications, new versions, and also hardware changes. Um, I'm sure that you will run out of storage space at some point in time. 
Uh, so you will need to anticipate that and, and making sure that uh, as part of your agreement, you can uh, have a, an area that, that addresses that. So hardware software changes, make sure that you uh, anticipate those and address them upfront and not as an, an afterthought. With regard to the request for proposal or RFQ or RFI or whatever you call it, with regard to the request for proposal, I always tell people to create a sensible RFP. And by the sensible RFP meaning, uh, don't create a 500-page document that requires the potential vendor to, to fill in every little detail. Because first of all, it's a lot of work, but some, most of it is really uh, commodity items that you don't necessarily need to, to find out what, what the details are. So create a sensible RFP, not too much and not too little information. Do create an RFP though, because a lot of systems are sold today without a request for proposal. If you don't have a well-defined list of requirements, you don't know whether the system would meet the requirements, and that could be often a source of potential disagreement. So write also a better contract. I'm, I'm sure that in the past several years working with a vendor, there were things that you would expect it and it was just not covered and because uh, it was never written down. So make sure you take the opportunity to write a better contract that covers all the things that came up as glitches, scotches in the past so you now can cover that. When I uh, ask the users of, of PAC systems, it, it appears that in many cases they don't have a test system. In many cases, as a matter of fact, I think when we do some polls, it's probably 50%. It's just, uh, this is a major mistake. You really should include a test system and start negotiating or specifying a system that is relatively easy at that time to include it. Because from a vendor perspective, it's just another license of their database or the archive manager and, and maybe a couple of licenses of their viewing station. So it's, it's for them, it's, it's relatively little cost uh, to throw it in, so to speak. And uh, the hardware also, I mean, if you take think about uh, stores the data for maybe a couple of days, uh, a relatively small computer system can do that for you. So include the test system up front. So then you can have a potentially uh, short-term backup and also a switchover system. And it allows you for a platform to do any, um, any major modifications and, and, and changes. Now, another thing you might want to look for is that uh, alternate service agreements. Look at the contracts and, and, and know a little bit about the uh, medical businesses. Uh, the vendors make most of their money on the service agreements. So after you get the initial purchase of the hardware and software, they make most of the money. Their margins are the biggest on the, on the service agreement. So that is also where you potentially could save the most money. So look at alternate service agreements. Uh, do you have a strong biomedical engineer in your department that you could send to a school and take some classes and also uh, have them learn about uh, supporting the system to a, a, a different level so that you don't necessarily always need the service agreement, the high-end service agreement from your vendor. And that's where, look at some of the literature, you find out that large institutions that really focus on that, they are able to save literally actually millions of dollars annually by uh, taking and getting some of the service agreements of house. Or, as another alternative, outsource to some of the service to third-party service providers. Interesting business third-party service providers. These are quite often the same service engineers that used to work for Philips, Siemens, CE, but now work for a third party and uh, could potentially provide one-stop shopping for your service. So look at alternate service agreements because that's an opportunity for saving some money and, and become actually even more efficient as well. Now, another thing that vendors are looking for is the Vendor Neutral Archive, or VNA. Some people call it the cloud. So basically, you have an uh, enterprise archiving system, and, uh, and, and a cloud application is a, it's a special application where the whole archiving by itself is kind of virtualized. You send an image to the cloud, and or an example to the cloud, and when you uh, want it back, you, you, you ask it back from the cloud, and you really don't necessarily know or need to know where in the cloud is exam stored and where are the multiple copies and, and things like that. So think about it. That's definitely something that you should consider. As a matter of fact, the majority of the users that are considering changing their vendor or upgrading to a new release or okay, making a major change, they're actually looking at, uh, at VNAs. Another component you might want to look for is the pay-per-service 
outsourcing your archiving makes sense in, in not every case, but in, in, in a lot of cases, particularly if you have some IT skilled concern. However, if you are archiving strategic assets, which is in the cases for research institutions and universities where they want to use this data for teaching education and for potentially grant application, then it might not be such a good idea. So make that trade off. But it makes sense to do a pay-for-service of your archiving system. As a matter of fact, you could even uh, outsource not only the archiving, but also the support of your PAC system. That is not done that often, but it's also a, an opportunity you can pursue. Risk analysis is very important. When you think about a risk analysis, think about not only you know, when people think about risk analysis, they think about security and privacy, but also what is the risk that a, a system might go down? What is the risk that a hurricane might hit or, or an earthquake or any other natural disaster or flooding? So do the analysis of what are the, all the risks for your integrity of your system and for the availability of your system for the potential that somebody might actually even break in or jeopardize the integrity. So look at the risk and, and see uh, whether you are currently covered sufficiently and what changes and modification you want to make sure that you are covered in the past. In, in many cases, uh, you can actually go through some of the events that occurred and said, how could we have this prevented? Think about how often your system went down and see what the cause was, the root cause, and what can you do in the future to uh, either not maybe potentially prevent it, but alleviate the pain. Then you also want to uh, perform a detailed acceptance test procedure. Another thing that is quite often overlooked when you uh, get a system, when does the system really meet the specifications that requires you to, to make the final payment? And does it really meet the specification? If you don't have a very detailed list based on the request for proposal, what the system is supposed to do and how is it going to meet your requirements and how it's going to meet your workflow. And um, if you don't have that list, um, there's no way you can check it. But if you have that list and if you set up this acceptance test, then, then it should be almost a no-brainer. You can go for it in, let's say, one or two days, go for all the different steps and say, yeah, the system works as we expected, as we agreed upon, and, and everybody is happy. Another important component is the future standards updates. I, I talked earlier about future updates in the hardware and software, but also new standards coming out, uh, new modalities. For example, what I learned recently is that a lot of people like to start using OCT, optical coherence chromography, for certain procedures looking inside vessels and arteries. This is a completely new procedure, and it also requires, in many cases, new standards new DICOM 8 or 7 standards and IHC profile definitions. So you might want to uh, anticipate those and also talk with your vendor and how the vendor will anticipate those. For example, if your plans do in the next five years, and five years is not too long, for example, incorporate uh, digital pathology that will, uh, just as an example, have a major impact on your storage requirements. In addition to the fact that you then also need to make sure that you can store and retrieve and, and show those pathology images, which requires updates in these standards as well.